So welcome both. Thank you both for being here. Um, I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Hello. Thank you so much, Alison. And thank you so much, Matthias, for joining us today um, as Thanks part of the 25th uh, anniversary celebrations. This is our fourth fireside chat and the final one. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. And apparently at least 40 people uh, here are also really looking forward to this. And we're also recording this and I, uh, more people can uh, see it later if they want to. Yeah, 25 years. Uh, what is it, what you started 25 years ago, would you have expected to sit here today? No, no. I mean, at, at that time, <laughs> Come on, no, we were all young. Nobody was thinking 25 years ahead. I think if we did, we would have done things slightly, slightly differently. No, that was definitely not the, not, not the focus. But it's, uh, it's quite unbelievable um, that 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 a project survives that many years and still still attracts new, young, talented people and uh, has a thriving community. That's I think that's quite fascinating. Yeah, and the graphics got better. Uh, all the time, I must say, yes. That is true. And I would say um, the even more fascinating part for me is that it's not just attracting new people, but that people are sticking around. Um, just looking at the list of participants here, there are quite a few old timers from the beginning of KDE still. Yeah, but, well, I, I, yeah right. I just don't know if they are still, still around in the project and active or just, just now coming back to see. Uh, to see the fireside chat, so, so that way. I think it's a mix of both. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So maybe we want to go back to the very start, and can you maybe tell us a bit about how it was twenty five years ago? What made you start this crazy endeavor, and what was it like back then? Okay. Um, I think. Michael uh, Renner, who is also in the chat, might probably remember better because my my long term memory is quite it's quite fuzzy sometimes. A bit. Um, of course, I was thinking before the talk. You know, what, what do I remember and how was the situation back then in in the wider scope? And it was really it was very odd times. I mean, for the for the younger ones uh, on the chat, like there was there was an internet, but the internet was really very academic and still scientific. There was no broader community uh, out there. And all the social networking was news groups uh, where you would go into a folder structure of topics and then you could have the same flame wars, wars that you have on Twitter today. Um, so the, it was the same kind of style, but in the development area, discussions were somewhat friendlier than it is today. So, so my feeling is like, now everyone's on the internet, and back then you had to be somewhere at university. So there was a bit of a filter, and there were not quite as many flame wars at the beginning or really personal attacks. You had special discussion groups for that. Um, but in that time, yeah, this was this was weird. But now, now think about little Matthias back then. I was I was really into computers when I was like twelve years old. I, I really got into computers. And that was the time of the Commodore 64 and Armstrad War. So there's these two things. And, and I went with the, with the Commodore, um, started programming there, and it was fascinating. You know, the, the assembler stuff is all cool. By the way, I started doing this again a couple of years ago and, and tried to write a, uh, some, some, some games and stuff and see how that compares to modern programming. And I must say, it wasn't that far away. So even back then, programming essentially was, was, was programming basically single threaded with the uh, interruptions of just all like like all the JavaScript stuff today it's the same same type of stuff um, but then computers were cool and then you had the Amigas which was kind of amazing and then I stopped doing computers um, I had to do my uh, Abitur I was doing music which uh, was um, far more social than doing computers back then of course and but but I was I was settled on okay when I come back from from the uh, from the army back then we still had compulsory um, uh, service military service then I would uh, study computer science and then I studied computer science and got a new computer and that was a DOS computer with Windows on it and I must say I was totally shocked I said like like 
that is worse than the Commodore and, and far worse than the, the, the Amiga. There was just a, a total piece of shit crashing all the time. The software was confusing. You couldn't do anything as a, as a developer. And that, that was really irritating. And I thought, what the heck happened to the world? And, and, and I thought, okay, shit, if that's how it is, that's just how it is. And, and then I was at the, at the university, one of the scientific uh, assistants, I think, it wasn't a, a, a professor, someone had a printout on a printer that said Linux. It was like almost two meters long, printed out on these, these matrix printers or what they had back then, and was putting that up at the door of his office. And, and I don't know who, who that was. And but that was Linux. And I heard, okay, Linux is this kind of free thing and Unix type of stuff or PCs. And I thought if, if somebody puts the name of an operating system up there on a door, you know, this is like, like, like a pop group or a rock group, that, that must be something fascinating. And why would anybody do that? Like, can you imagine somebody putting Microsoft there or, or, or Windows? You know, it's, it's, it's unthinkable. I thought, okay, let's try this thing. And I bought, that cost a lot of money, baby, and I think I bought 60 disks and downloaded that stuff from the internet and, and, and installed it. Um, half of it, because I bought the cheapest disks I could find, floppy disks, um, half of it was broken, so the system wasn't very functional at all, which helped me getting into it because I had to debug all the packages that didn't work. But then I had this thing running on my PC and it, it felt like, it felt like totally strange because there was, on, on the one hand, it was this old stuff from the 70s, you know, and on the other hand, it was totally futuristic, like, like the future, you know, multitasking and networking and all these, wow, um, on the same computer that was running like Windows before 3.1. And so it felt like, like this, maybe in history, if you go back, the, the Renaissance guys, you know, that discover the ancient writings and the ancient art and the mosaics and, and signs. And then, wow, compared with the shit they had to, at, at that time. And then they were renewing this and adapting it to the modern world. This is how, how Linux felt. And, and I just thought, wow, this is amazing. Why isn't everybody using it? And so came the thought, okay, maybe it's because of this, you know, lack of user friendliness, etc. And then I, I, I got this idea, like, can't we can't we make Linux so, so everybody can, can use it? That was the basic idea. So basically I was a fanboy of this Unix system and, and, and thought, you know, how can we make this uh, something for everybody? It's um, funny how similar this is to, when you say it felt futuristic, it's funny how similar this is to when I started using KDE software. Um, but this was not at the beginning of KDE, but maybe KDE 3.5. So quite a few years later, but still, it felt very futuristic. <laughs> um, okay, this this sounds really cool, and and um, especially this feeling of being able to to tinker with with your operating system and your software and so on. I think this resonates quite a bit with uh, people who who are attracted to to KDE and who can who can change what um, the system they are working on every day. I must say I'm I'm less of a far less of a tinkerer, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of more a lazy guy. I prefer when things work. And <laughs> for the tinkering, I was always lucky that I was surrounded by people who liked the tinkering and made things work. I mean, I mentioned Michael earlier, whom I, I shared a flat with, and he was definitely the the system administrator um, uh, among others, and and kept all things working and and, and networking and made sure things work. Same with KDE, we had guys like. Uh, Stefan Kulo and many others who, who got the whole machinery working around the release process and stuff. That's not really, that's not really um, my thing. I, I really like computers when they, um, when they work, um, I must say. But most of the time computers don't work, that's true. <laughs> I, I think we all like it when computers work, but sometimes you, I, I mean tinkering in the sense of I can make it do what I want it to do as opposed to having to just use whatever whoever invented it um, yeah, imagined i would use it for a feeling of empowerment but and yes. that's true and sometimes you know i liked it when computers do things like in the real world um, yeah. that was so that was so cool when like people write something with it or create content with it and now we have some software where you can 
edit videos and, and, and stuff. So you do something um, outside just computing. At some, some point, free software felt a bit like, okay, we do software so others can do software. Like this was the thing most of the time when people ask me, what, what are you doing for work? When I was working at, at Trolltech, like I make software so other people can write software. And then there was, what? what? Okay, so what exactly do you do? And, I'm, and it's impossible to, to explain, but when you then saw what the customers did with it, and it's just, just amazing. I mean, we are talking about the likes of Disney and Pixar and the movie scene or synopsis, you know, somebody needs to design these chips in your computer. And, and, and for that, they need software. And the guys who write that software need other software so they can write that software. And that's the software we are writing. And <laughs> so it's a, it's a long chain. I mean, if you think about it, what humans have created with, with software, there's hardly, you know, we are amazed that when we see the, the pyramids in, in, in Cairo and think, wow, thousands of people must have built this thing. Now you take any piece of item or something, your phone, and you wonder like, okay, how many people have contributed to that just in the last year? It's just totally amazing what, what we have created as humans, um, this complex stack that so many people contribute on different levels and, and, and something comes out of it that actually works, at least most of the time, it's quite stunning. That is amazing indeed. <laughs> if we go back to 25 years ago, um, you sent this email announcing uh, Kelly. Can you maybe talk a bit about what happened before you sent that email? Because this wasn't how it, when it really started, right? This was when you announced it. Right. Um, yes. Oh, okay. So well, well, I did I did a software project before. There was the um, the Lux uh, document processor, which is still still around, quite a niche market for scientific papers and uh, with with LaTeX. So I had a bit of ex experience creating open source software and building a small community. And but as I said earlier, I was a fanboy of Linux, and and I had this machine at home, and I wanted to make other people in the student community use Linux. And I said, okay, wow, you can do everything, you know, fully empowered. You take this window manager and this panel and you set up this tool and this editor and stuff. So I was basically doing my own distribution. And, and I was doing the same for the university because um, people there would, would log into Unix machines and they, they got basically nothing. They got a standard X window background, you know, this mesh pattern and a pointer. And I think if they are lucky, they could get a right mouse button menu where they could start the next turn. That was what they got. And of course, they were all confused and didn't know what to do. And, and so I tried to set up a system that had a panel and, and, and some standard applications that made it easier to use this stuff. And then I figured out it's actually quite hard to make something usable, which is kind of consistent. I, I noticed that I was using, like the apps I was using were using five different toolkits, all having different usage patterns like okay if the scroll bar looks like this use the right mouse if it looks like this use the middle mouse otherwise use the left mouse you cannot teach that to anybody you know windows was crap because it was crashing but at least it was kind of consistent in, in some ways and and so i was looking for technical solutions what we could do there and i was in investigating toolkits and i think i tried i don't know i think I tried four or five toolkits and was writing code with it. And then I discovered these crazy Norwegians uh, with Qt and I was totally sold um, that this might be the path forward, not being not aware of the, of the license problems, because at that time, you know, you had GPL software using motif and stuff and was in this linkage UI, blah, not a problem, et cetera. And, uh, of course, I wasn't prepared for the for the shit storm that then was fired by um, by the Red Hat guys um, against it. So I thought I did a thorough technical analysis, which would be the best choice to move forward, and ended up with Qt, and that's what I proposed in the in the email. And I think I even had a small outline like what kind of applications would be the most important to create to get this little desktop system in place that is that is usable for people. Nice. Yeah. Um, I also remember that in the email, it said something uh, along the lines of Qt being a really technically excellent uh, product. And, and that's why um, Kitty was based on that. And of course, um, as you were saying, there, there was a lot of um, 
discussion or in efforts around that um, after that with the Kitty Future Foundation, for example, and um, the the agreement between Trolls Hack back then and, and KDE to to ensure that Qt is available for, for KDE and free software as a whole. Um, I mean, uh, the, the KDE Free Qt Foundation, it turned into the KDE Free Qt Foundation, but the, mm -hmm. the Qt Foundation, the idea of the Qt Foundation is older than KDE. Howard Nord, who came to the Linux Congress in Würzburg, uh, that was the Congress where we first presented KDE. Um, the idea, we had a little bit of code, that was uh, Carla Dahlheim and me. At that time, Howard Nord already um, talked about the the necessity to set up a foundation to get this free software thing problem out of the way, because they had thought about this uh, uh, earlier. It was just when we then had KDE, and that that brings us to why KDEV at the beginning. We needed an entity that could actually enter in a contractual relationship with Trolltech. So was that the trigger to create KDEV in the first place? Yes. Yeah. Then we thought if we had an entity, we could have other assets with it, like the the, the, the trademarks and domains and mm -hmm. etc. And and at the same time, we maybe could even have a sort of a governance body that makes like official releases or stamps and these type of things. But that that didn't go all that well. <laughs> KDE on stamps, I, I like it. <laughs> maybe we can still get that. <laughs> um. So you had. Uh, Saying that then, um, you you like uh, Qt technically very much. Um, looking back at uh, that decision today, would you still make the same decision? No, I'm in a very difficult position. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Because, yes, um, because all right, I, I was thinking about this question. Um, uh, uh, okay, let, let me check some some notes because I was I was wondering about that, and I think it's a tough one. It's really a tough one because. Qt, Qt has a lot of things going for it. Um, and it, it made the life of many programmers easier. And, and many of the people who learned programming then with, with Qt, then went into the, out into the market, into companies, and, and wrote like Windows, Mac, cross-platform, Linux software, and they had a much better life and, and could do fancy stuff. And if you see what's now happening in the car industry, on the embedded side, there's a lot of many interesting things happening. We also had the first Linux-based phone with Motorola out of China that was using Qt. We had um, we had the PDA in uh, the Sharp Soros in Japan, and a couple of things within uh, Nokia, which were quite amazing. So Qt did a lot of very good things, and it still does today. For um, Linux, I mean, first, okay, look at C++. C++, also back then, nobody loved it. We did not love C++. It was just a very pragmatic choice. And, and also remember 96, 97, 98, C++ was not quite as, as it is today. I must say, I think the language developed in an, in an odd direction and it became worse and worse. And, and now I would not, I wouldn't, I stopped using it to, to be frank. And I went back. I'm doing most of my programming now on the back end with, with Golang, which is basically, you know, you take all the learnings from C and you cut all that object oriented and functional programming crap in the middle and you find out what were the elements that were really important and you try to bring this in and, and the model works with my uh, aging brain really, really nicely and I, I feel I'm extremely productive. And with this knowledge, I think um, C is not that bad. And if we had taken the technology we had in, in, in Trolltech or KDE at that time with generators, like something like Mock for C, we could have implemented um, a system that could actually work. So, so for, for, for Linux as a whole, it was a disaster that we were splitting the communities. Um, we should have tried to make something together with C and maybe C Qt as a commercial option for the cross-platform and, and merge these efforts. Um, that was just, just a problem. Um, I think it was wrong. Uh, and C could have been a better choice. C with it, like add-on features for signals and slots and stuff uh, could have been a, a much better choice for the Linux system. You see that with the Mac. You know, it, it basically has 
objective C is basically just signals and slots plus plus C, and 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 how how effective that is still still uh, still today for programming. Yeah. But having said that, I think the mis the fault was not just with us or with Troll Tech or, or with me personally. I think uh, Red Hat was not very nice back then. Um, they they had a lot of money. Um, they were kind of giving out the message, like if somebody's making money with Linux, it's us. The rest of the ecosystem should be free. There was no path for anybody else to get in there and also make business other than consulting uh, with Linux. Red Hat could easily have stroking a deal with, with Trolltech. Back then, Trolltech was five developers with super low salaries doing 50% consulting. You know, it, it would have been totally easy to set up something, find any sort of agreement and, and get that going. But there was absolutely zero interest because there was also, you know, there was this American Europe thing and people not communicating well and no, no internet for phone calls and, and video sessions. And that was just extremely difficult. I, I, w I think it was a disaster to have split this community. And I was thinking at some point, maybe the competition helps us. You know, GNOME and KDE, competition, healthy, haha, cool, and we can agree on things. Maybe it's nicer. But to be honest, I think this competition had some good elements, but partially it turned into a, pardon my French, pissing contest when it came to features. You know, we have this feature, we do this feature, 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 and it was more like competing on the feature side with GNOME rather than trying to find out what the users really needed and, and wanted. And at some point, I think GNOME gave up on the feature race and, and said, all right, let's, let's cut it and we just make it super simple to the bones and really do the minimum and stuff. And that was a successful strategy for them in the long run. And so in a way, we did help GNOME a lot, getting them focused on, on their target market and, and, and getting something there. Um, but it didn't help us um, uh, too much. The path that KDE has chosen to have these super formidable, you know, configurability and choice and stuff, and at the same time simplicity, is super um, hard. It's hard and it's costly. Uh, like when the when the code for the settings dialogs is larger than the business logic, then then you know you you're having problems, and all of that needs to be tested. And if you look at the um, competing offers, like the Mac OS, which is like, you know, my way or no way, um, it's of course a far easier proposition to make. Yeah, I, I would agree. We definitely haven't taken the easy way out. Um, but I think we've learned a lot over the past years about how to, to balance this complexity against what's really meaningful for for the users we're we're targeting yeah but it, it's not an easy trade-off to make and uh, there's quite some complexity that we're, we're getting from that definitely I um, think there's some interesting discussion happening right now on the chat which i like to comment mm -hmm. so yes golang is a back-end language i think it would be a perfect language also for the front end but somebody needs to do something about it i think it would be possible to almost implement a flutter style system um where you have like a, a separate tree of widgets and a separate tree of your, your logic and you try to map these things similar to the DOM. And so you get a declarative style or maybe even a, a, a QML type of style would work with Golang. I was trying to convince Lars Knoll to put the Qt company on it, but, but they are busy with many other things and it doesn't quite fit. Um, there's a one man project somewhere that tries to do a UI for, for Golang, but it's a, well, it's a one man project doing this properly needs you know right now the bar is very high if you want to create something that can compete with flutter you know these guys have so many resources and so talented people and you look out there and it's not just the code it's the examples the documentation the videos the the, the support that you get around it the whole package uh, it's very very hard to to do um so what i'm doing right now if i have to do a quick mobile app or something i would i'm, I'm using um uh, flutter with dart which is an awful language because it's just a slightly fixed uh, javascript and and flutter is, is 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 weird in terms of how how you think about ui but it's but it's working but on the back end golang is great now people bring up rust 
My problem with this is remember XPCOM, I think was the name. Uh, remember Gecko and all these things. I really, based on my experience, I wouldn't trust things coming out of the Mozilla Foundation to be the survivor and the winner in any technology race in the long term. That's sad to hear. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so we talked about Qt as one of the things coming out of this announcement, people having strong oh, opinions. Sorry, one more comment on, on Rust because we get this. Uh, this mm -hmm. thing. Sorry, Lydia. Uh, so, so, yeah, uh, so I haven't tried Rust enough. I know great developers like like Simon Hausmann and stuff are, are, in, are in love with it and, and many people love it. And, and maybe that's a that's the thing I'm, I, I most certainly applaud. Uh, people who have a fresh thinking on programming languages rather than adding features and features and features that everything is there and, and, and nothing works properly. So, um, so good. Um, if, if Rust goes somewhere, that, that would be great. I, for myself, I'm currently in love with, the, with Golang because the whole tooling is just amazing that they've created around it. Which I also remember as one of the big selling points for Qt. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So um, you sent this announcement um, message to to the news group, and people had opinions about Qt as as the chosen toolkit. What else happened? Like, did people approach you to to join? Um, what did they want to do? Well. Uh, I in the announcement, there was this limit that if we get like 10, 20 people or something, uh, then we then we can get started. The time was definitely right. And many people joined immediately the next day or a couple of hours after the announcement. And we put up a mailing list and, and then we got started writing code quickly. Uh, one of the first people to join was uh, Matthias Kalle Dahlheimer uh, from uh, Star Division back then. Who, of course, had already a name in the community. He was he was an author of, of books, and he worked with Star Division, gave talks, etc. So he came with a network uh, of people uh, that he knew and and a name, and uh, that attracted others as well, and and gave us a, a foothold. Um, we quickly re realized that if you want applications, Linux wasn't all that great to write desktop applications because you had to do a lot of um, it's not even boilerplate is, you know, you had to write a lot of cool functionality yourself that didn't exist in the system. So, so the first thing we created was KDE Lips, I think was the first module. And, and one of the first classes was KConfig so that applications could actually store state um, in the, in the file system. Um, so KDE has always been about the development experience as well, rather than just the experience for the, for the users. And that's what happened. And then it, it went fairly, fairly quickly. I mean, at the beginning, it was it didn't take too long before we had a version one. The problem with version one was still that we felt like a user desktop should have some documentation. Um, so I remember I was in, I was before Würzburg. We went to Frankfurt trying to pick up Torben Weiss, who's now a professor for computer science in, in, in Frankfurt. Uh, and wrote the uh, the the first version of what's it called Conqueror at the beginning, KFM I think was K KD File Manager, um, and the first KHTML, and so we were in his room and have to had to prepare the release the first beta, and I remember I was still sitting there writing a lot of the user documentation myself, and this is when I developed the uh, severe RSI this. Uh, uh, strain injury syndrome and I could hardly type so I had like scarves around my hands and try to still write um, which resulted in me taking a break of three or four weeks where I couldn't do any 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 coding um, which was total stupidity um, but the break was nice I guess after that yeah, yeah unfortunately that happens um, yeah okay so am I the yeah. only one did the other guys like there's a lot of people in the chat. I would like, you know, did, did any of you develop problems with your with your with your hands and and what do you do? So I I for myself I'm using this is the 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 one piece of Microsoft that I really like apart from Visual <laughs> Code as the sculpt keyboard, which is currently the only keyboard I can use for more than half an hour without getting in pain. Yeah. 
while people are um, typing in the chat, um, you were talking about many people being in the room, and I've heard stories about the founding of KDEV and that happening in your dorm room. Is that true? Yes, it probably is. Yes, yeah, yeah. That was in the apartment with uh, with uh, with Michael, so he might he might remember. I think we pulled him in as well uh, because we needed to have a, a quorum. Yeah. Uh, yes, that's that's true. That's the humble beginnings. So it wasn't it wasn't a garage, but it was a a, a funky uh, Wohngemeinschaft somewhere in, in Tübingen. I believe it was one of the old houses from the French army that they built there, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, yeah, including um, partners uh, being brought in to have the quorum. <laughs> um, sounds like an interesting uh, origin story for me. Yeah, but the most fun thing, I think, and that process took much longer because we thought that would be easy. Like we thought, okay, look, none of us has a commercial interest. We write a lot of stuff that is highly valuable and, and we give it away for free. How can that not be, uh, um, you know, kind of a, a, a charity? And 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 how can we not accept donations without paying taxes for that? And but the, the process to actually get this approved was very, very difficult because, of course, the financial authorities had no idea was what what software was, uh, uh, nor what free software was. I think that process took a lot longer, and luckily, other people took took care of this um, afterwards. Yeah. Um, so, when you look back at things, um, and how you had imagined KDE software to develop and, and compared to where we are today, um, what was that the direction you imagined or hoped for? Well, um, when we started this thing, you know, Renaissance, wow, we discover the past, which is the future, and this is so great, and how can people not see this? And uh, and, and there was all this movement, and there was, uh, the distributors got there, and we had the Deutsche Linux Distribution, we had Caldera, we had um, SUSE uh, in Nuremberg, we had uh, Red Hat, of course, Mandrake in, 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 in France, lots of companies were popping up, and. And this thing seemed like an, an unstoppable train in our little uh, uh, bubble, but but we knew we were the we were ahead of people, and we were ahead of people. Like we were in the internet doing social networking, uh, working on a Linux-based system. Now everybody does that; they just call it Android. And uh, so we were ahead. Like we, we we were part of a movement that notified the world, but it didn't quite turn out as 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 we liked it. Back then, for sure, I had I had thought like. Um, that universities and, and schools, public places, and, and many companies would eventually move to Linux with all that support from the distributors, and that this is a, a given, and we get more software for it, and, and that this this Windows thing will just just go away, and um, which uh, of course didn't happen um, for various for various reasons, and some of that is our fault, but. I think in the end, users don't care if the software is free because they never pay for software or they don't see it. So that was not an argument. And if you look at what the macOS did, um, macOS basically followed that story. You take a Unix system and you create an alternative UI system on top of it, alternative to Windows. What was necessary for the Mac OS to succeed? First of all, I mean, yes, you needed Steve Jobs, genius, and his total focus on user experience. That that was one thing. Okay, let's let's say we can do that by having um, long and heated email threads and discussions, and we all agree and we make the right choices. But then, what did they need? The Mac had dedicated hardware that can realize the strength of the system. Linux had to work on all sorts of shitty PCs. And when it was installed in schools, it was installed in schools, right? It, it, it happened, but it, all of this was removed later. But at that time, schools went out and installed Linux distributions, et cetera. 
but it was on crappy computers that can hardly uh, they, they couldn't even run Windows 95 properly and and so all of that died away okay back sorry I'm, I'm confused now hardware dedicated hardware second thing was they had some great software that did not exist other places and they picked a niche for that their niche was music and video editing now we, we have video as well but that was the big thing and then the making the computer the media hub of the life you know now this is all in the cloud but you had it you know this is the machine where i have my music and i have my photos and i have my videos that was the thing and then number three they got microsoft office on the platform and without if you remove any of this you know the beach hat for something um the, the hardware support done by the hardware vendor and Microsoft Office, you cannot establish an alternative platform. Just not possible. And that's sad. You know, we were, I think we were fighting an uphill battle there. And, and maybe that was not everybody's battle, but that was certainly my hope that we could we could somewhere go there and have a have the system established um, uh, for most most people. But of course, that never happened. You know, desktop Linux was the people started joking like next year is the year of the linux desktop right and, and and that went on for a decade yeah but for me it was always the year of the linux desktop i have not <laughs> used anything else on my desktop for uh, 25 years <laughs> yeah. yeah um you you previously mentioned um us having heated discussions on mailing lists <laughs> and it got me thinking um one of the things that i always found interesting about KDE as a community compared to other big projects um, at the time when I joined KDE was that it didn't have this one benevolent dictator that said, like, this is how we're going to do it now, um, as opposed to, for example, Ubuntu or uh, the Linux kernel and so on. Um, and I wanted to ask you, was that an intentional decision uh, by you? Was it just how things happened? Is this your character or how did that come to be <laughs> well the ubuntu thing comes with the deep pockets you know if you have very deep pockets and you pay people it's easy to be a, a, a benevolent dictator um with with kd i think the project has a too too big scope um to to, to have one direction um at, at all it doesn't suit itself to to somebody controlling every single uh, uh commit uh like like um Linus would do on the on the kernel, but for sure it has to do with. I think it had to do with what's the purpose of KDE, which was not defined. It was always this project for developers and many different aspects and going broad in all directions. But of course, also with personality, and uh, I think mostly with 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 personality. And somehow this this idea, like, wow, can't we be like a a brother and sisterhood of of people working together? And uh, in addition, I had a conflict of interest at some point, you know, when, with Qt, when I, when I then decided to, to work for Trolltech, I still considered myself working a lot for, for, for KDE, make, enabling KDE to work better and, and, and getting Qt to be a totally free software. But I felt I have a sort of conflict of interest and I, I cannot make these decisions for the, for the KDE project. So I, I, I felt okay just being one of, one of many and working together. And this is, by the way, also, I think the biggest achievement for us all in the KDE project is we learned how to do complex software together. And what we had, the systems that we had in place were far better than many commercial companies back then, the whole development process. And, and what we did was, you know, we didn't have a scrum master or a manager or a Kanban board director, wiper something, processes, tools, stand up and, 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 and rituals. And, we were just working together um, as software developers and, 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 and of course, testers and, and writers and, 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 and uh, designers. Um, but no managerial overhead whatsoever. And that was just fascinating. If you, I mean, I've been working as a consultant for, for some time and I've seen many things, but just something like KDE2 or KDE3, let, let alone KDE3, if you let a modern software company develop that, I mean, that's thousands of developers and hundreds of managers 
and a lot of time because modern developers spend 50 percent of their time in meetings and the rest of the time they are planning their work and and they hardly get anything done and people think it's normal so maybe that's one of the things <laughs> that was hard for me then later that if you come from the free software community and the KDE community, the quality of the people is so high that if you then enter the workplace, you're like, most of the time you're shocked and, and you just want to go away. So do you think this mainly comes from KDE attracting very good people who can work in on a complex system without all this yeah, I, mean, yeah this is, I think it's twofold. It's self-selected. First of all, you need to be curious um, mm -hmm. to, to join a community like KDE. And, and then it, once you do, you see so much that, that you learn quickly, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's not what they do. I mean, most, most companies hire somebody who has done a training course on front end or full stack or something, and then they work on the same 5,000 lines of code for a couple of years. And, 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 and that's it. I mean, you, wow. I mean, Right, the KDE project created a web browser. Um, that's that's like on a totally different uh, different uh, level. Yeah, that's a that's a very good point. Um, speaking of web browser, <laughs> um, what would you consider some of the more technical achievements of KDE over the years? Well, I, I think the biggest achievement of KDE is that we brought developers together that they can learn from each other and communicate. But we also brought developers and users together in a wider community. So, so a developer needs somebody to to write, to use that software so they get a feedback loop. And we've created this community space where this can happen because right now it's impossible to attract people. Before KDE, there was a time when the whole free software community was small. And there was an FTP, file transfer protocol for the younger guys, um, service run at uh, sun.edu, I think if I recall correctly, Sunsite, yes. And they had an open incoming directory. Everybody could write into that incoming directory. And then they had moderators who would look into that. And if it wasn't something nasty and problematic, if it was code, then they would set the um, readable flag. And then you could download that from incoming or it was pushed into some 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 other uh, directory structure and that was that was the community right you could upload code somebody could download the code and then send you an email when you put your email address there and back then that worked there were people monitoring this directory for new software today it's impossible you know if you didn't have a community like kde if you want to write something and you're trying to get some users i mean how would you do that post on, on, on Facebook, you know, and pay ads for somebody. I mean, it's impossible to get any publicity right now for free unless it's a community like that. So that's for sure the, the, the biggest achievement. Um, when we talk on uh, technical achievements, I think I, I'm very proud still that we have a desktop communication bus that started with, uh, with DCOP and then, then turned into, in, into DBus because that's an interesting piece of of a distributed system architecture that is necessary for, for a desktop to work. Um, KHTML, KHTML2, um, later WebKit done by Lars Knoll and, and, and friends, and Zangon and many others, uh, for sure is, uh, is, a, is a stunning technological piece. I think now it holds the whole world back because the <laughs> uh, um, this dormant structure is like was limiting for, for many 3D things and stuff. Um, but yes, that well, maybe for the listeners who don't know about WebKit, um, it's <laughs> the underlying thing yes. that today most of the web browsers you use right. are based yes. on. And there's still elements of that architecture and some of that still holds us back in some ways. Uh, you know, the web is also, people talk about the, the year of the Linux desktop, but the web was the same thing. You know, they've been saying that all software will, will be web which is only true for some of the uh, consumer content heavy things and and on the on the mobile devices you know it's all native apps and don't don't tell anything about react native because that's really just the i think it's mostly like very simple or crappy apps that use it all of the good stuff is 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 is, is native or using non-web technologies on mobile 
which is quite stunning. So the app model does not go away uh, or did not did not go away. Um, other technical achievements. Well, look at, I said earlier that you cannot establish an alternative desktop system or you could not establish that without having Microsoft Office compatibility. So K Office was for sure an, um, a very important and, and big technical achievement, but it's so difficult um, to do, of, of course, without a, a business around it, you, you, cannot, you cannot sustain it. But it was, what was there was highly advanced and still much better than the alternatives you find today. The companies who try to compete with Office or do something like Apple gave basically up, or they were forced to give it up or they didn't have to do it. Google Docs, I mean, look, K Office could embed spreadsheets at the very beginning. That was the big thing. It could embed diagrams and graphics into a, a, a document. Try that with Confluence or Google Docs today. It's, it's, it's insane what you do there. You're happy with lots of authorization, separate web app now, put, update all. I mean, it's ridiculous. The quality that we have in, in document editing uh, on web apps is, is, is horrible. People accept it because there's no, no, no choice, really. So K Office was great. I think also Qt and, and QML, I see that as part of KDE, I think was a, was a big technical um, achievement. Yeah. All right, we have about 13 minutes left, so I wanna take some of the questions that people put in their shared notes. Um, someone is asking, how long have you contributed to KDE? In which area, um, uh, uh, when there were many back then, um, which ones did you work on? Okay, well, which is the, okay. Hmm. Well, at the, it was kind of funny at the beginning when we had the first KDE meeting in, in Arnsberg and that was the first time, there was no video conferences back then. And that was the first time we met each other and um, there were like 25, 30 people, something around a big table and everybody was saying their name and what they've been working on, their app. And then in the end, it, it came to me and I said, I said my name and I said, and I'm basically working all the other apps. And, and at the beginning, I was really doing a lot of different apps, mostly starting them and then handing that over to somebody else in the hope that this would then grow and I could do something else. So I was starting a lot of things. I wrote the first terminal version, some, some, some editor, the, um, the window manager, the, 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 the panel and uh, the session manager and, and these these type of things. Um, mostly it was, I think, panel and window manager in, in, in the end, then when, when it became more mature. And at some point I was shifting my focus completely to, uh, to Qt, uh, working on the underlying systems that a couple of years, until Qt then was sold for uh, to Nokia. And that's, that was basically when I stopped contributing to KD directly, but I was doing um, Qt Creator and, and, and QML and these type of things. Cool. Uh, someone oh, is... Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, please go ahead. Uh, someone is asking, uh, which Linux distro and desktop do you use? Um, I'm currently, I'm, I'm, I'm running a slightly outdated Ubuntu version on this laptop because it, it's a ThinkPad and it works very well with the with the hardware, and I've been using um, I've been using um, Unity for some time. Um, at some point, I must say I I stopped. Um, I started to use Unity or looked at, at GNOME, partially because I had to get my mind off KDE. Because when I see KDE, and there's something I don't like. I, I need to go, my, my brain triggers me to go in and contribute and do a fix or something or change it or something. And, and I know if I'm using this Ubuntu thing, I, there's no, just nothing I can change. And when like Ubuntu was using Qt at some point, I thought this is okay, I can, I, I can do that. But frankly, um, I noticed that I'm using the window manager to I'll tap between windows and I'm using a terminal and some well, a Russian developer a couple of years ago told me about a terminal called Terminator, which has a, a really bad name, but it's, it's quite powerful. So I have this big terminal that I split and I zoom into terminals. That's, that's what I'm doing. 
and I'm using the window manager. I'm not using any visual apps anymore at all. That's, that's like most of the stuff is just really the um, the web browser, which happily is a descendant of, of, of KDE. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, then someone is asking, and I don't know if you notice, uh, how much of the current code base has been written by you? Well, if kconfig still exists in some of the libraries, I'm, I'm, I think, think there's some elements that are still by me. And, and Qt is a, is a huge code base, and there should still be a significant portion of code uh, that I've contributed. At least I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Someone should find out. It would be interesting to know. Um, cool. And then someone is asking, how has the philosophy of KDE changed since the beginning? Well, I think, you know, I had a KDE philosophy and, and many people who joined had their own philosophy. And so I don't know if it, if it has changed. For sure, there was a, a conflict at some point um, because I was far more on the side of the, of the gnomes, like uh, user-centric, you know, simplify things. Try to make something that you can give your, your mother, your father, your aunt and, and your granddad and make this work. And uh, we get the cool tools for the development side, yes, but the desktop should be like this really slim, simple uh, system. That was my thinking. Uh, whereas um, many others said, like, I want more themes, I want more styles, more configurability. At some point, the KDE team couldn't decide on anything. And the standard answer was always, OK, we add a configuration option. Not knowing what the cost is of doing that in maintaining that software in the, in, in the long run. And, but we had nobody, I was not that person for sure. And, and uh, we had nobody who could really have this vision, uh, could be the PO in modern you know, uh, uh, culture, like you could define how would that experience be that we are trying to do. And, and so at some point it became, a, it became community. That was a big change. I think it has now changed a bit and it's now more focused on users again, but at some point, it became a community and we said, you know what, let the world be the world and we do software for ourselves and we use it and we have a community and we are happy and we are learning about the things we are doing and we are having a, a, a good time, which was perfectly well because Katie was quite big uh, uh, to do that. But the, I think it became a project that was satisfied with itself rather than being a force that tries to change society towards, towards free, free software which was probably the right thing to do, because as I pointed out earlier, it's not possible to get um, free software without a business context out there in the, in, in the world. People didn't want it. They started, the school started, we had this on the chat earlier, but at some point all of that went, uh, went away. Yeah, well, but that, that was a, a good point uh, you're making about how then KDE started out as rather technical and focused on, on on building those applications and then today more shifting towards what i think you're you're after um thinking much more about who is going to use our applications and what are they going to need and and how are they going to work with our applications and, and building something um you very know, good for you know, it might not even be us <laughs> right right but you know um I think I had another chance in, in, in having really something big happening. And that was at, at Nokia. At some mm -hmm. point we used Qt modern version like with QML and we had the funding to create a new phone. Um, and, and then Stephen Illop killed Symbian. And we had all these developers looking for like um, a way out and a new project to do. And we, we tried to make a new phone, which was more like a low end phone. Um, and we, we said like, it would be nice if we had like a hundred people and maybe 200 and then we can do all, all sorts of things. And then we got all these teams and then we got like, I don't recall, it was like among, I think it was around 1,200 engineers. So the same group you had for the original Android and we had them for over a year. And now that was the total nightmare because that was way too big and organizing that is totally impossible. But we had the chance to say, okay, poof, now mobile, you know? We built this complete new stack based on, 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 on proper uh, uh, Linux and all, all Qt based, like absolutely stunning. 
And despite this huge amount of people, we actually managed in the end to get something working, which was a total nightmare. I think I lost most, most of my hair during that project. And then when it started working, it was killed because even Nokia at that time, still being a market leader said, there is no way to establish a third system. And Microsoft also failed to establish a third system. There is no space for a third system. A third system is something you can only do with cross-platform software. Two is the maximum number. You see that companies write software for Android and iOS, and it's okay to have two teams to do that. Number three, no matter if it is like some other Linux, some Nokia Linux, or if it's Microsoft, nobody will write software for. This just does not work. There is no space for a third system. Speaking of Nokia, um, someone is asking if the Steam Deck from Valve could be the next Nokia. So for those who don't know, uh, Steam Deck is the new device that Valve, the game publisher, is, um, is bringing out um, to play games on, um, similar to uh, other gaming consoles, and they are uh, putting Plasma on it. Uh, from KDE, which is of course amazing for us. <laughs> um, but could that be the next Nokia? I mean, we're not talking about a, a billion devices that people carry in their pockets uh, around and that lots of companies develop software for. Um, but it's, it's good to, to see these. You know, it's, it's nice that you have um, real things out there that, that, that run the software. That's just, just amazing. I mean, there will be hundreds of thousands of users here. Um, that's, that's cool. I just think the phone is, uh, yeah, I mean, the phone is incredible. Ad admit it. I mean, how much time do we spend looking at the phone? And we do things there that we never did with the desktop computers before. It's just, it's, it's a stunning device. And, uh, and uh, it's sad that free software plays so little role on, on, on the phone. Um, if you think about it, yeah, you know, Software, there was a time when KDE was started where, they, where you could actually sell software and people bought software. But I think that was an oddity in history. It wasn't like this before and it isn't like this now. People don't buy software. Businesses can do that, yes. They can license technology, but people just buy hardware and the software comes extra. And this is what you see with these companies funding free software. They have a model where they sell hardware or they sell you as a product like Google does and, and Facebook does. And that's why they can, can finance some free software development. But um, apps, people don't buy the apps. I think they, they buy to get rid of the ads. That's, that's what they do. And, uh, and, and payments you only get for services that you deliver. So nobody's interested in actually selling, uh, buying, buying software anymore. That is a good point. Um, and free software on, on all these app stores and so on. Um, we're making some progress, of course, with KDE software being ported to um, Android and iOS and being published on those uh, stores, thanks to Qt among other things, of course. Um, but yeah, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, all right, we're getting close to the end of our session and I have one last question from the audience. Do we have a hard stop in, in 27 seconds or what happens? If you have uh, more time, we can also <laughs> take a bit more time. Four people, but we can go finish the questions at least. <laughs> All right. Um, the question is, what do you currently do as your day job? Well, I was, um, for the past three, more than three years, I was running a consulting company with uh, Daniel uh, Rubio, who is now the CTO of, of Trafi, so he moved back to Madrid. Uh, we're still doing a little bit of consulting, but we are um, reducing this. Um, I. Today was actually kickoff. Um, I started a new company with uh, three friends of mine, uh, uh, Raphael uh, Jung and, and Thomas Strehl, um, also from a former SUSE employee and Trolltech employee. And uh, we are going to do something in the area of uh, fitness. Actually, I started running a couple of years ago. And uh, so Raphael is a, is a professional coach. He runs a, um, a diagnosis company here in, in, in Berlin. And we think we can do something significantly 
better compared to other systems for um, ambitious hobbyists and slightly better runners um, with with gear and stuff, which is quite quite fascinating because there's a lot of science around it and modeling of the human body, etc. And there's a lot of IT technology, you know, with watches and heart rate sensors and stuff, and a lot of back end stuff and a bit of uh, front end app coding as well. So that's what we're trying to do. And 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 yes, um, uh, we got an um, uh, Reginald Stadelbauer who, who wrote the first Cape Presenter, and then uh, was running a successful company doing testing technology for Qt and Web and and, and Java. He's also uh, on board. Seems like a good group. Yes, so it's it's very small. You know, I'm I'm kind of I had I had my my share of of big business and big teams and but uh, it's good to not hear about scrum masters and scrum of scrums and and all this sorry um cargo cult nonsense uh, for a while that's quite quite nice but yes you make my heart as a product budget bleed a bit <laughs> no okay look lydia so okay look, I, you know we are among friends here so we can we can talk uh, openly the um the challenge right now you have in the business is because software is everywhere digital is everywhere we are growing and we need more developers and i think the the, the number of developers is still doubling like every couple of years so it's clear that the most people in the workforce are uh, unexperienced and the big challenge every company has is, okay, I have relatively unexperienced people and I need to get something out of them. And we are really good in doing this um, uh, with all these technologies and, and help and tools that, that there are in the, in the agile world. And if, if a, a competent um, agile coach is organizing that and taking responsibility, then all works fine and you get something out. However, this is not the same experience as if you had really a people experienced eye to eye same level working really close and there's also the in large corporations there's also um coaches look you can go in and neither the scrum master nor the po nor the engineering leader nor the this or the that feel responsible for the output and and, and then you come in as a consultant and you try to help and and um, and you know, don't you don't even know where to start, right? And that's the curse of too much money. And we had that at Nokia as well. If you are too successful because your business model is so super great, uh, then it's then it's really problematic to do any changes. And I and I like it when we have scarce resources, and and you know we need to fix an optimization problem with you know what do we do and how do we focus? I think that's that's much more fun. Yeah. I agree with you uh, that it is a lot more fun to work with a team who is who knows what they are working on, why they are working on it, and and just know how to do it. Um, then <laughs> David Madonna is asking, you don't you need to be happy as a consultant that the companies are working in the way that they need your help? <laughs> yeah but it, you know i don't say i felt not like yeah maybe <laughs> it's a tough one yes in one way but but you want to you know i i don't know the type of people we were we were always bonding quite a lot with the with the with the company and we genuinely try to help and sometimes you succeed and something comes out of it and that's then really really uh good and and and, and great yeah maybe i'm just trying to justify why I'm giving up the good income of a of a consultant for for a really small risky endeavor in a very crowded uh, market space but um, yeah I think everyone here can <laughs> can understand that decision <laughs> yeah um with KDE yeah um cool do you have some questions or recommendations or last words for our audience, maybe? Something you think they should? Sorry, I, I did not get the last question. Is there something you would like to ask or tell our audience here as some finishing words? Um, 
Okay. Well, I, I'm quite in, in, interested is, um, is there anybody here like the, who works with, with, with Qt and, and KDE also for, for, for work? Or is this mostly like a, a private, private fun? Yeah, Nate. Yeah, this is nice. So this is good. So KDE and Qt generated some jobs. We can work with good good technology. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I was about to say uh, there are definitely more people in the in the list that I see that are working um, with Q. Look yeah. at what Michael writes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Wow. Awesome. Very clever of them. You know, to standardize and have a system that 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 works. Awesome. Really good. And and Mercedes, I think, is also a great user of uh, of Qt embedded. And uh, at least I hope so. I think so. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, maybe I need a, I, I will, I will upgrade at some point, but then I lose a lot of time working with all the settings of the desktop and try to configure it in the just right, right way. Yeah. But isn't hardware. Yeah. So somebody was asking about the form factors and TVs and stuff like this. Yeah. It's all difficult. Uh, it's difficult. I don't know. I have a smart TV and and the problem of the smart TV is, is basically the input device, right? You have this horrible remote that is designed by a designer um, for for the looks, you know, no very few controls, and then you try to try to input something, and then the microphone's too far away for the voice input, and it's really it's a it, it's a diff smart TV is a, is a difficult thing to to do. I just fear that the tablet takes everything over. Are you guys using tablets? Um, Lydia, do you use the tablet to create content as well for, for like drawing, writing, taking notes, or just for, for consuming web? Or, uh, this is now an ad. I have a remarkable tablet here. Oh. Or, um, and I, I kind of love it. It's really nice. <laughs> Can recommend even if it's a bit expensive. Yeah, tablets is a cool thing, I must say. Yeah. For some reasons, I, I don't know why, but it just feels because a tablet you can use in a very cozy sitting position on a comfy chair or something, and then um, yeah. Um, so you're saying Remarkable has some KDE software in it, right? Uh, yes, and it's the, uh, the boss of the company is even a former KDE person. I think we can probably can you share it? Show something. Show something? Yeah. Um, what do you want me to show? <laughs> uh, what's the name of the company? And I couldn't quite see. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, Pine64 has been playing the announcement card that they are also going to do something similar um, in the future with KD software. So let's see. Very, very nice. Yeah. Yeah, the pine note. All right. Do we have anything else? <laughs> All right. Then I have one last question for the audience. How long have you been with KDE? Good one. <laughs> we have one year, 20 plus years, four years, 20 plus, 25. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> Four months, 2004, two years. I think we have a pretty good mix here. Wow, yeah. But it's, it's, it's stunning how long software survives and the compatibility. You know, now, now KDE is, 
the, some of the KDE code, like KCONFIG, is just as old as the Linux, uh, the Unix code was when we were starting KDE, kind of, you know, it's like <laughs> in, in the middle. And it's quite amazing that this, this stuff still, still works. Yeah. That's quite nice. And it still has acquired a lot less technical depth than, than on the Windows platform. Isn't it still stunning? You know, when we started KDE, Microsoft was the big enemy and they, mostly because their software was really, really awful. I mean, they struggled with it partially because of the history of, of DOS and the long memory that was there, et cetera. But then it didn't get much better and it was getting worse. And, and how with all their resources, they totally messed up the user experience and introduced widgets. And now they had Metro and the traditional and everything was duplicated and it became even worse than unbelievable, you know, and, and, and they never got around of doing it. And then I thought it was funny when Microsoft for the first time in their history um, made a consumer product that was actually good. That was Windows Phone. It was actually good. I mean, the experience was good. Then they failed. <laughs> and it's kind of sad, right? Whenever they produce crap, they, they are so successful. And, and when they had good stuff, it was just, just totally failing on the market. Yeah. But Visual Studio Code is actually a nice piece of software. I know you guys probably use KDevelop, but for Go development, it's, it's quite, quite, quite nice to use Visual Studio Code. It's actually a nice piece of software. Nate is making a good uh, point that a lot of KDE code is, is older than many of its developers and users at this point. Yeah. Windows <laughs> 11 looks like plasma. Yeah, that's true. But what is your what is your thinking? You know, shouldn't we, is the is any one of you in, in touch with the with the GNOME community? Is it still flourishing? Are there still things happening outside the Distributors or canonical? Comments there are some. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we are, for example, organizing together the Linux App Summit, um, mm -hmm. which is about getting more people to build apps for uh, Linux distributions. And also getting our apps outside. <laughs> so Jeremy writes there also like lo losing developers and stuff. Yeah, I mean, look, when we started, there was we all had the hope. I think the gnomes had that, and 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 we definitely had that that Linux is going to take over the world, right? This will be the standard way to interact with computers, um, and that that of course was very motivating for people to 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 join. Yeah, and now now it has become maybe. A bit of a sport and something elitistic, but but everything good at some point turns into, you know, slightly elitey thing. Yeah, I mean, look, <laughs> yeah, it's just 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 how it is, you know. When when you use Linux, you have better computers, definitely. Just like when you listen to jazz, you listen to better music. Most people do pop stuff, so that's it. So I'm very happy that there's still young people and we see um, new people being attracted to it and, and they're enjoying. I think what you can learn in a community like KD is just just amazing. And uh, all of us who were there, they people wrote so much code and read so much code. If you compare this to most standard software developers, this is just like a magnitude of difference. And, and that brings you experience, right? You cannot be a good software developer if you haven't written a lot of code. You just need to do that at some point. Yeah. That is very true. And I think one of the big things that a lot of us take away from KDE, right? Just learning, trying, doing, uh, and then applying this in other parts of our lives to or making KDE stuff part of our day-to-day uh, -day work. <laughs> even I'm better. Giggling, uh, Lydia, sorry, I'm giggling about the K-pop, uh, <laughs> which is really funny, yes. <laughs> Hey, and, and, and somebody mentioned at the beginning somewhere. Um, yeah. I still think the cool was not so bad a name. You know, there was cool in the gang and it was a misspelling and something. It was a bit edgy. It was, it was okay. At least the letter K was available for all applications. And then I was looking at the 
So we, we, you need a name because there was only one path variable in the, in the shell and you needed a name to start all these programs. And so, so there was often a shell program called foo and there was an X program that called X foo and maybe a GNU version, there was G foo. And so, you know, we needed a letter that was the K foo, which was good. Um, the, the, the problem then was the, the first user interface that we created we had these desktop config files and there was a name there. And I wanted in the menu of the panel that there was no K term, but there was Unix, where you could enter Unix commands. And there was no K sysguard, which is still there, but there was like system tools or something, you know, or system, and, and you had a, a proper name, but at some point, <laughs> The, the community, we were so geeky and nerdy that we wanted to have the command line executable names also in the UI, just with different spelling. And it's now system monitor. If you go to kd.org, I think you see K syscard. You still see K syscard in the menu right now. I, I was there before the, before the talk. Yeah. Uh, so maybe it's just an old screenshot. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yes. K syscard was done by, by, um, What's his name? Working for AWS in Dresden. Yeah. 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 So apparently that has now been superseded by system settings. Why was Dr. Conkey named Dr. Conkey? Why <laughs> um, well, Conqueror was Conqueror? Oh, the debugger thing, yeah. Yeah, um, uh, it's right with gedit and text editor. But at that time when we did it, you know, there were not no, no different choices. There was just one following the UI convention. So we thought it was better to give a generic name. But it, the generic names never took off because then we have the GNOME stuff and then we have the KDE stuff and, and, and then you, you had to prefix it with the with a K and so the K became visible everywhere. But it was nice when we at some point had a conference in I think Cologne and I remember Stefan Kulo went around and loved to photograph the, the car signs um, because everything was there. Like we had KWM, which was the window manager back then and of course KDE and K this and K that. Most of the abbreviations were visible on the, on the car signs. Someone in the chat is talking about um, KDE being derived from CDE, which was the other existing system before. Yes, yeah, yeah. That was why it's called desktop environment. Otherwise, we wouldn't have, I wouldn't have named it. That was the closest thing people came up with because uh, before I was talking about KDE and desktop environment, the community always referred to. UI as window manager. And even at the beginning of KDE, the first couple of years, people always said, oh, that's just a window manager. And I said, yes, yes, a window manager for managing your files and your, your printers and, and writing uh, office documents and stuff. People had no, no conception of what that was. Um, yeah, that was the window manager. And then, so we, at the beginning, we always had to explain, no, no, this is just a part of it. A part is a window manager. It's these little frames around the windows. And, and there was a lot more more to it. There was a commercial thing called CDE, yeah, based on based on motif, which looked nice, but it had very very little functionality. Someone is asking how kind of the wizard was born. Do you know that? No. Don't remember. Yeah. Some designer must have drawn something. <laughs> it's cool. It's really cool. Yeah. Um, so I was suggesting that it's derived from Gandalf the Wizard. Pretty I sure. Guess. <laughs> that sounds All right. cool. <laughs> All right. I think we wrap it up. Let's wrap it up. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, this was super interesting. I hope uh, you enjoyed it as well. I very much enjoyed it.
to see some some names and, and and getting in touch with the project i hope you know when this whole COVID thing is over and that there will be some real meetings as well uh, in the future and we'll again. have an academy again and maybe a dinner in berlin that would be really really nice <laughs> all right thank you so much thank you can i get this this picture can you send me this uh, anniversary picture slide that you that you're showing Alison can probably send it to yes. Yeah, sure. All right. All right. Thank you very much, everybody.